Hello and welcome to this Signatures interview with special guest, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson. My name is Rebecca Sykes, and I am an archivist with the Governance, Military, and Political Section of Library and Archives Canada. Over the past year, I have been working with Madam Clarkson and her office on matters relating to her phone, helping to make her records more accessible to the public. And I'm Tora Gustafson, the Governance Archivist within the same section. I've been getting to know the Clarkson Fall in preparation for this interview, and I'm looking forward to working on future donations. Canada's 26th Governor General from 1999 to 2005 is universally acknowledged to have transformed the office and to have left an indelible mark on Canada's history. She arrived in Canada from Hong Kong with her family in 1942 and made the astonishing journey from child refugee to accomplished broadcaster, journalist, and distinguished public servant in a multifaceted lifetime. Her legacy foundation, the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, helps all new citizens to be included and to belong in the fabric of Canada. Madam Clarkson has had a long relationship with Library and Archives Canada, and we were actually in discussions to acquire her personal papers even before her Governor General days. Tora and I are just two of several archivists from LAC who have worked on the Adrian L. Clarkson phone over the years. Projects like this one often consist of hundreds of boxes of material, of diverse formats covering the individual's entire career. These projects are a real team effort requiring several archivists and archival assistants to process and describe the material over the course of multiple years. We asked Emily Reza, who was the lead archivist processing Madame Clarkson's phone, to reflect on that experience, and she had this to say. As a young female archivist, Fortune entrusted me the deep honor and privilege of processing the Adrian Clarkson records. This will forever be a highlight of my career and solidified my love for private archives. The hours spent reading letters, sifting through photos, and cataloging her many awards and honors were a gift. Madame Clarkson's public life is extraordinary, diverse, contributive, and historic, and the records bear witness to this. As archivists, we do not always see the equal richness of private life in the records. Adrian Clarkson's records correspondingly demonstrate an intimate and contemplative private life. The decision to trust Library and Archives Canada with her legacy was generous of spirit and will influence generations to come. With that, we turn it over to Librarian and Archivist of Canada, Leslie Weir. Thank you, Rebecca and Tora, and welcome, Madame Clarkson. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you so much, Leslie. It's lovely to be here with you. Well, and thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people. And I acknowledge them as the caregivers of this land in the past, the present, and the future. And I invite all of our viewers to take a moment to acknowledge the territory on which they live. And I wish to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the city of Toronto, which is on the unceded land of the uh, Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Adnasoni, and what is known as the dish with one spoon. So the signatures interviews are unique encounters with Canadian personalities who've donated their archives to Libraries and Archives Canada. And we always look to discover hidden treasures in the collections through our conversations. <laughs> That's wonderful. I think treasures is, is something that, you know, I, I have to say right away that it's a surprise to me to have things kept. Perhaps it's the background of having been a refugee, even though I was only two, I think I was imprinted terribly deeply by the sense of that loss of being, torn out of my own background, even though I came with my family. Uh, so I had a little nucleus around me. But I'm always amazed, for instance, in comparing myself to other people. I don't tend to keep things. I don't tend to have a sentimental value to things. I always, I suppose, deep down in my heart, I am a refugee. And I feel that everything could always be taken away from me again. So why should I keep it? <laughs> so if my parents had not kept you know, all the things from my, my childhood and my university years and so on, I probably wouldn't have much. And I guess because I had good assistance, 
who kept things on file for me. But I never think about the things of the past. And that's, I'm very glad and grateful to Library Archives Canada for keeping that because I think in the future, it will be interesting for people to see what my life was like 100 years on uh, when Canada will have changed so much as it has since I came here 78 years ago. Um, so thank you for giving me a memory. Well, and thank you for bestowing uh, your trust in us to uh, keep your archives. And we are, we too are very grateful to your parents um, <laughs> for keeping some of the treasures that we're going to see today. Um, we've got incredible materials that relate to both your professional and personal life. And we have documents that touch on your family, your education, your career as a broadcast journalist, and of course, as a writer. There's even material from your time as the Ontario Agent General in Paris and incredible years that you spent at Rideau Hall as Canada's Governor General. Well, I'm really thrilled that you have all of these things because I think in the future when people want to pick through it, and you know when you read good biographies of people and you know that the biographer has gone in and looked at all, all the material available and then made their own assessments, uh, I think it's very interesting if somebody in the future wants to look back at what the meaning of my life and how they will have to piece it together through, I guess, uh, you know, records that exist for the television programs and then the paper thing. So it's fascinating to me to think that in the future that will happen. And um, and I think that it, it's a it's a kind of it's a kind of a a, a living on um, which will be. Uh, part of the times that we've lived in. I've lived in the most privileged time in Canada. I think a number of us who all turned 80 within a year or two of each other, a year ago or two ago, we're all over 80 now. And a number of us met, well, 65 years ago when we went into our first year at Trinity College at the University of Toronto. My closest and best friends are still the people that I knew first met when I was 18 and now we're 80. And um, so we were going to do a little book that was going to be like A.A. Milne's Now We Are Six. <laughs> Should we do one that says Now We Are 80? <laughs> and, and what we were like then and what we were like, we haven't changed, you know. Basically, nothing really changes. And Alfred Adler says that the child is made and formed by the time it's five uh, because the child has made up its mind what kind of person it's going to be. A very interesting theory, which I think, you know, I would I would go along with. I don't think I have changed that much since I was five. I've done things. I've traveled. I've learned languages. I changed careers, etc. But I think I was probably the same at five that I am now at 81, nearly 82. Well, and I tend I think I agree with you uh, on that front. And it's incredible that you are still close to um, your classmates that you uh, went to Trinity, Trinity College with. And I think one of the things that's amazing about, about your archive is it also reflects Canada at the time. Mm -hmm. So you take us through that period and, and really give us insight into different aspects of Canadian society. Uh, so I think people will be able to study your life and your career, but they'll also be able to study Canada through your archives? What they won't see are things that I think are fascinating, which is that growing up in Ottawa, which I did, which was a town of about, now somebody's gonna tell me I'm wrong, but I think it's a town then about 150,000 people, 1942, uh, until I left when I went to university in 1956. So we're saying 14 years there, and it grew a little bit. And I know now it's a million people. Uh, but then it was a small town. It's the size of Barrie, Ontario, which is the town I go through to go to Georgian Bay to my cottage. And so there were, you know, four high schools. There were in downtown, there were six public schools. Uh, everybody knew everybody. Um, it was a it was a very white place. I've said it's a white bread, white snow, white town. And I never saw a, a black person or even an Indian person in my childhood, except once I was invited to the Indian Embassy for their National Day or something, and I saw Indian people then, but no, none of them came to my high school, I don't remember, although we had children of other diplomats come to Lisgar Collegiate. And, um, and so I never saw a black person, I never saw a brown person, and the only Chinese, other Chinese, 
were the ones who had the restaurants and laundries. And we had come from Hong Kong. And so we hadn't come from the same part of, of, of that life as the immigration that people thought of as Chinese. That was That's what was really different. When I was governor general, I used to be driven, you know, occasionally around 3.30 and I'd see the kids gathering around the, the bus stops at Glebe Collegiate or Lisgar Collegiate at Elgin or on Bronson. And when I saw those kids, I mean, they were from all over the world. That just didn't exist when I was growing up. I was a novelty. Well, and it has changed radically. Um, I'll say that I did have a chance to go through a number of uh, uh, the boxes with uh, Rebecca and Tora. And it really was amazing to see the, the rich history um, that they contain. And I, I wanted to start our discussion on a subject that is extremely uh, near and dear to my heart, and, and that's reading. Because um, I saw a lovely picture of you reading as a child. <laughs> and I know, I know that you're a voracious reader. And I, I just wondered if you can remember what sparked your love of reading, or if it's something that was just always with you? Well, you know, I learned to read, I learned to read by myself. I mean, my mother said, used to say, um, and it was why I was rejected from kindergarten and where I wasn't happy, because when I went to kindergarten, I could already read and I was really bored. And since I didn't make it to the band, I would, I wanted to play the triangle and they didn't think I was good enough. And I was very unhappy. And then uh, I was taken home and I was put into grade one where I was much happier because I was able then to uh, to do other things and I already could read. So I was far ahead. But actually, the the privacy of reading, which I considered to be interesting, we lived in a very small apartment. Um, I shared a room with my brother um, initially where we were in bunk beds. Uh, there was very little privacy in that in that sense. And, and I think a lot of people grew up that way. I'm not unusual. Um, so for me, the first thing that made me really love reading was not all the nursery rhymes and various things like that, but I was given by our neighbor, uh, in the part, a little apartment building that we moved to after Sussex street, that was our first home. But then we moved to an apartment building on Laurier West at, uh, near Bronson. And I was given Anne of Green Gables by our neighbor, Flora Priddle. And I used to go over and look at Jamie Priddle, who was a beautiful baby boy of about six months initially when they moved in. And Flora Priddle said to me one day, you know, Adrian, you're old enough to read Anne of Green Gables. And so she gave it to me. And I think that's in my personal library, which I'm certainly going to give to the archives. <laughs> uh, I think it's fascinating that that was my first book. And I loved it. I loved reading about Anne. And I, it to me, I've said this before, I said it to, at the University of Prince Edward Island when I got an honorary degree there, it made me Canadian. It gave me a Canadian past. Being part of that extraordinary uh, family of people and that really tight, interesting society filled with, with intimate uh, feelings and best friends and, and, and sacrifice, because Anne did sacrifice herself in her last year to stay with Marilla and not to go off to Prince of Wales College, which she had to do later. And then her, the, the eight Anne books to me were the history of Canada. And the last book, Rilla of Ingleside, is the story of her daughter. And it's the story of the First World War and how it affected Canadians, how it affected the Blythe family, Anne and her family, because two of her sons, Walter and Jem, go off to war. To me, reading that at the age of nine or 10, taught me about Canada and the sacrifices that Canada had made, that one of her sons dies and the other one comes back really very shattered. And that I got not in history class when I got to grade 12 with Mr. Herbert Tennant at Lisgar Collegiate, who was a great history teacher, but never mind. I got it emotionally. I got emotionally what the First World War had been to Canadians when I read that when I was 10 years old. So the love of reading was started by that. And I then got... Uh, we lived on Somerset Street then afterwards in a house, and I used to pass the library at the corner of Metcalf and uh, and Laurier, the big library like a Greek temple with the wonderful steps which, oh, Ottawa, you have destroyed, I will never forgive you. And next to it was a little brick house called the Children's Library, the Children's House. 
And I learned that I could go in there and I could get six books out for every two weeks. And I was on my way to Kent Street School uh, in grade seven and eight. And I every every two weeks I took out and brought back six books and I read them. And so that picture of me on that couch, which that couch, by the way, was bought on a layaway plan from A.J. Freeman's. I remember my parents being so proud of that couch because we could afford it. <laughs> and, and I kept it for many years and it finally got lost somewhere in one of my moves. But I really loved it. I called it my Mackenzie King couch. And I remember how comfy it was. And I had it recovered several times and used it at cottages. Uh, but I loved just lying out on a couch or lying out on a deck chair at the cottage and reading and reading and reading. Nothing could make me happier than reading. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested to talk now about how you did go on to uh, earn both an honors BA and a, a, an MA in English literature uh, from the University of Toronto Trinity College. And uh, we have a graduation photograph of uh, you here with your parents. And um, I look like how that. gorgeous my parents are. I really, you know, it's lovely to see this again because um, I just, I just remember how you know proud I always was of how my parents looked. They always, you know, seemed to me to be very beautifully dressed and and to be so elegant in their own way. My mother always made her own chung sam because that's the that's the dress of Hong Kong women. And um, in those wonderful movies uh, that in the mood for love, where Maggie Chung, it's 1960s, but she's wearing chung sam. I always think of my mother. May, having made her own uh, Chang Sam through the war because she only wore, she didn't ever wear a, dre, a Canadian, what she would have called a Canadian dress. She wanted to keep her Chang Sam. She wore trousers, she wore pantsuits, she wore occasional suits, but for dress and dress up, she always looked like that. And my father was very proud of, of his tailoring and so on. So, you know, they look really terrific there. And that was that. That year was exciting, 1960, because I graduated from my honors BA in English language and literature, and my brother graduated from McGill as a doctor in 1960. So you could say, you know, in the 18 years since we arrived, with our one suitcase each in Ottawa, uh, that we had done quite well. And I'm sure that they were extremely proud of, of, of both of you. So that was a big year for, for you and your brother and for your parents. Well, I remember driving home from graduation and my mother sitting in the front seat and she suddenly just burst into tears. And she, I mean, I had, I, I actually only had seen her cry one other time, which was when she got the news that her father had died in Shanghai. And since it was communist times and everything, she hadn't seen him for years and years. And I'd never seen her cry before. She just didn't cry. She burst into tears in the front of the car. We must have been around Napanee or someplace that that road between Ottawa and Toronto it was very familiar to me. And I said, "What? what's wrong? And she said, I don't know what the purpose of my life is now. You're both graduated. <laughs> I just remember that so clearly. So such a moment. Um, so what what when you graduated, what were your professional aspirations? Did you have any idea of sort of what you wanted to be when you grew up? No. The, you see, the only reason I went to, to, and I studied English language and literature was that I, Mr. Mann, my, uh, the most important figure, adult figure in my life besides my parents was my high school English teacher. And he, he turned me from, my, my skills were in mathematics. I, when I did those tests that you do as a, as a child, then they, which are things I can do math like nobody's business. I did grade 12 geometry when I was in grade 11. I still would love to do geometry again. I did algebra and trigonometry. I loved mathematics. There was something about mathematics. And Mr. Mann said to me when I came into his grade, his grade 10 English class, he said, you do mathematics very well, but if that's not going to be for your soul. <laughs> and so <laughs> reading with him for three years that he was my high school English teacher, taught me that I did have a, a literary soul, that I wanted to read more and more and more interesting things of everything that had ever been written in English. And then Mr. Mann said to me in grade 12, after I had won the Rotary Public Speaking Contest and stood second, he said, um, I think you should go to Trinity College, which is where I went, and I think it would suit you. 
And so that set me on the path for my life because my parents had wanted me to go to McGill as my brother did. And I had to really have a little struggle with them. And the deal was if I got a scholarship to go to U of T, they would let me go to U of T. If I didn't, I would have to go to McGill. So I never worked harder in grade 13 than I ever worked again. I mean, when I think of things that I've done in my life, never have I put myself into such a condition of work as I did in grade 13, because you had to have 13 papers for the University of Toronto in the old senior matriculation days where your papers were all sent to a central place in, in, in uh, Toronto and they were marked anonymously and you were numbered, etc. And your whole life, my whole life depended upon it. That's what I remember, that struggle was so, Great. I thought if I don't get into U of T and get that scholarship, my life will be over. I was very dramatic. And um, I think I learned that also from Anne in Anne of Green Gables. There was nothing wrong with being dramatic about your own life. You're li after all, you're the, you're the heroine of your own life. There, you know, there may not be much, but you're all you've got. And, um, <laughs> and so I worked so hard and my parents respected that. They always respected everything that I wanted to do. They treated me always with enormous dignity. Loving is one thing because love can be interpreted in different ways. But if the parents did not respect them as a person, they never recover from that. They never recover. They can get some success. They can do some things. And for a woman, her father has to respect her and her father has to believe in her. And that is what gives a woman her passport into the world. A woman does not get her passport into the world from a wonderful, strong, incredible mother. She gets a role model for how to be a woman. Uh, she could get all sorts of things from her mother as a woman. But the world as it, it was existed, certainly when I was growing up, I have my good fortune, which just happened to me, was that I had a father who totally and utterly respected me. My mind he also thought I was very good looking and that was terribly important to him. I don't know what would happen if I hadn't been good looking because both my parents held a very, you would even say superficial almost um, uh, belief in good looks. They really, you know, always looked at people and say, well, gee, they're really good looking or they're not good looking or, oh, you know, it looks like something, you know, that should be driving a truck. Uh, and they were not kind about that sort of thing. But I think they were always, it was part of their dignity, part of their self-worth. And I think it was partly cultural. I think I think the Chinese, uh, certainly of, of their group, um, really held a lot uh, by how you look. And, um, and my father always said, you know, people say, don't look, don't look at things that are superficial. He said, but you know, the superficial often counts a lot. <laughs> And I've always kept that in mind because because you never know, you know, what you see sometimes is what you get. But working hard that way to get into university, then I got, uh, Mr. Mann said I had to go to Trinity because he had gone there and, um, and he thought it was the best college at the University of Toronto. And so I was, you know, trying to do my best for Mr. Mann. I was trying to get the scholarship, et cetera. I had been accepted into residence if I got there. And I, you know, I was ready to fly out into the world. I was only 17. I was early, it was early uh, to go to university, but I'd started because I got into grade one because I could read. Uh, I went through school like a lot. And so um, I was young for, you know, for the, for the time and everybody whom I graduated with, and we still see each other. We were to have our 60th reunion this year. That was our thing. But of course it had to be canceled because of COVID. And um, it taught me a lot about just organizing, helping to organize that, because I helped to organize our 50th as well. And of our class that went into Trinity, something like 129, in, when we were 50 years graduated on, there were still 115 of us alive. And we were all then 70. And now we were starting to do the numbers and it was astonishing the number of people that were still alive, which I attribute to the injustices of a class filled society, which we still are, that we had the best education. Therefore, we know how to take care of ourselves. Therefore, we got good jobs and we got into the upper middle class and all of that. And comparing us to the people who are dying 
in the neighborhoods because of COVID and because because of exclusion, because of uh, of their incomes, because of their color, etc. It's is something that I keep in mind all the time. I come from a very privileged background. And in Canada, we like to think, oh no, well, everybody's the same and equal. Certainly we were brought up to think that way, but you know, class um, does, does count for a lot and it counts for uh, it, the unfairness really of why people live longer, why they have better opportunities, why they don't become addicted, uh, why they, you know, not necessarily why they aren't abused, because I've done, you know, as a journalist, I did enough stories on middle class women who were beaten by their husbands not to believe that it was uh, something that on the, uh, only people who were, were uh, uh, had had low paying jobs did to each other. But I still think that, you know, the, the, the idea of the privilege um, of us at that time in the 50s and early 60s is something that now I think about as a past thing and everybody has their lives are so much more materially better but I don't really know whether they have become better in terms of the things they care about in terms of what they want to do I was of the Lester Pearson generation Suez happened when I when I was uh, in my very first fall of 56 at Trinity um, we were really, really concerned about the world, about making our mark as as the brokers of peace. We were the Pearson generation. Uh, we were the people who went to World University service. Who Stephen Stephen Lewis left third year. Uh, he was at University College, and I was at Trinity. But I knew him, and he left, and he was he was going to be on the Students Administrative Council, which was a a, a big deal and lots of fun and the kind of thing that you aimed. To wanting to do when you were at university um, and I was going to be vice president and he said I'm gonna you know I'm not he was going to be treasurer at him and he said I'm going to leave I'm going to I'm going to Africa and he said Africa and he said well they really they you know that's where a lot of things are really happening and I want to you know I want to go there and find out what's going on and it was seeing that kind of commitment uh to service, which Stephen had right then, because he'd had this marvelous father, David Lewis, who was legendary already, um, that that made us, you know, was was the kind of peak of things of people who wanted to do things. We were we were brought up very much thinking we can do things in the world, we can do things uh, to help other people. Uh, maybe it was our transference of our own colonial image. I don't really know, but that's the way that's the way it was. Wow, so your time in Trinity obviously had quite an impact too on, on the rest of your life and on choices that you made. And I, I'm kind of curious to explore a little bit um, your, your entree in, in, into journalism. And, and I mean, you were first hired as a book reviewer uh, for CBC television on the variety show Take 30. And um, we have a few scripts uh, from some of those uh, book reviews in your collection. And uh, I'm just curious how you um, got the book as a job review, uh, uh, sorry, got the job as a book reviewer and, and sort of moved into the, the sphere of journalism. Well, it was really, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I thought I'll go to graduate school and I'll do, you know, I've done an MA. I did my MA on an obscure poet called George Meredith, a very interesting poem, actually, a long sonnet sequence that he wrote. Um, he was better known as a novelist, but you know, it was fun to choose something that nobody else was doing. And then I thought I'll just continue. And I, I had my thesis picked for a doctorate, which was on Matthew Arnold. I was then interested in his prose, not his, I love his poetry, but I was going to do his prose. I was going to do a, a PhD on, uh, humanism and scientism in the 19th century. It's basically a philosophic, more philosophic work than a, a literary one. Uh, the difference between um, looking at life through a philosophic lens and life through the scientific lens, which was the Darwin, Thomas Huxley, that kind of thing in the 19th century, because 19th century thought really captured my imagination my fourth year. And um, so that was, you know, that was just a, a possibility. And with that in mind, I started my graduate work and, um, and then I 
uh, got a job as a part-time lecturer in my second year of working on my doctorate uh, as a lecturer at Victoria College. So there are still some some people who come up to me in the street occasionally and said, you taught me Tennyson and Browning because <laughs> I taught two courses and one was was on Tennyson and Browning and the other, which put me off teaching forever and told me that I must never get a PhD or go to a university because I would ruin a lot of kids' lives if I did, um, was on, with the first literature in translation course that was ever given at U of T. U of T is a very stodgy place and just didn't do anything very imaginative. But they finally, uh, in 1960 one or two or whatever it was, decided they were going to do uh, a course that would, you know, do Samuel Beckett and Ibsen and and people like that. And um, I was asked to teach that course, which I very much thought I would like because I liked all the writers that were involved in that Sarge and so on. But I didn't, I realized that I didn't like students. Uh, and I was not interested in what students had to say. I am interested in being taught things. I'm interested in hearing things that I've never heard before. I'm not interested in particularly in giving my opinions to other people. Why should they care? I mean, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think of myself as a particularly original thinker. I think I have ideas and I think I have, I have fun with ideas and so on, but I don't want to pronounce to a group of people, this is the way you should look at William Shakespeare, or this is the way you should read the sonnets, etc. I don't, have that feeling about myself. And so I felt that the students didn't care either. They were mostly medical students taking this course, one obligatory course in the humanities. And uh, I felt that they didn't read anything. We did one thing a week. And I love Ibsen. Ibsen is my favorite playwright probably ever. I love The Doll's House. I love Hedda Gabler. I love The Master Builder. I just love Ibsen. And um, so we were doing the wild duck. So I, you know, they, they were to read and then they come in and then I would lecture. And I just had the feeling after this sixth or seventh week that they weren't reading the things. They were just listening to me talking about stuff. And so I started to say, you know, Ibsen uh, appeared at the end of the 19th century. And, at the end it, and then I just, something came over me. <laughs> I just said, Mr. Harris, because he was a young student at the back of the room, there were 30 of them, 32 of them, please stand up and tell me what The Wild Duck is about, because they were supposed to have read it. Right? And he stood up and he said, there's this old guy, and he doesn't get on with his family, and he has to live with them. And he saves this duck, and it becomes his pet, and he puts it in the attic and has this relationship because he loves the duck. And one day when things aren't going very well, he goes upstairs and shoots the duck. And I went, I, I, I said, thank you. And then I went to the window and I remember looking down from that classroom. I still see where I look down. And I looked down and I thought, if I could continue with this, these kids are going to ruin my love of literature. They're going to ruin it. So after that, I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to continue doing my PhD. <laughs> and I think the world of academia was much better off without me. I went to a party and a girl I had been at St. Hilda's with, again, that's the women's part of Trinity, that's why Trinity is so important in my life, said, gee, how are you? What are you doing now? And I told her, I'm, you know, I said, I'm trying to finish a, a PhD thesis. It's not going terribly well, not, not very interested. And I just said, I'm not going to lecture next year, so I'm not even going to be able to earn that little bit of money. And she said, you know, I'm working at the CBC. And I said, you are, because to us, we love the CBC, you know, Television had begun in 1952 when we were all in grade nine or something. And we thought it was wonderful. It was only one channel. We saw everything. And um, and I said, you, oh, how'd you get that job? And how do you get into the CBC? And she said, well, she said, I'm a script assistant. And, you know, I, I, I there was something, uh, some, she told me how she got in. It certainly wasn't by answering an ad, but she did get in. And she said, you know, she said, I'm on a show called Take 30. It's an afternoon show. And it's basically for people who are in shift work or housewives. And it goes all across Canada and people really like it. And we've been trying out various people to do book reviews. And we just tried and she named somebody who was a professor that I knew. And she said, and they're not very good, the professors talking about books. She said, you'd be fun. Why don't you, why don't you come and audition? So I said, 
sure. I mean, you know, yeah, right. And I had never been in a television studio. I didn't know what television was. So I said, what I have to do? And she said, well, it'll be eight minutes long and you'll just look at a camera and just talk to the camera about three books. Tell, tell the audience about three books that you like and make them different, like make one a cookbook and make another a, a literary book and make another a picture book or something. I said, is that all? And she said, yeah, just, just do that. So, you know, I went home and I did that. I wrote that up. And I think you probably have that in the archives. And um, so I went in and I went into that studio. I had never been in a television studio in my life. It was Studio 6 in what is now gone. It's now part of the National Ballet School. I walked in and it was the dark, it was completely dark and there were these big things there which were the cameras and there was this spotlight area and a table and I brought my books there and some man came rushing down. Nobody ever takes care of your feelings at the CBC. They never did, they never will and uh, that was just the way you are. Anyway, you had to really, you go through a very uh, tough life when you work for the CBC. It was never ever different than that. And um, so I put my books on the table and I, then, then this very nice man came up to me and said, I'm the studio director. And he said, that's camera one, that's camera two, and that's camera three. And he said, I'm underneath them. And when I say, and when the light goes off there, the red light goes off, I sweep you over and you look there where the red light goes on. And that's all you have to do. I said, okay. So I gave my little thing. I did my book review and, um, and they said, we'll call you. <laughs> and a week later, they called me and they said, all right, we'd like you to come and do that once a week on this show. And greatness. I said, gosh, really? <laughs> Fabulous. And um, and then they they uh, I, I did that. But I had to go and, and talk to a wonderful guy called Eric Hawk, who was head of, of all English language programming, to because he was going to discuss my pay with me. So I walked to his office. He had a he was a wonderful character with an enormous sense of humor and irony. And he looked at me and he said, where have they brought you from with his wonderful Germanic accent? He just died last year. I miss him so much. He was a lovely man. Um, and he, where have they brought you up from? And I can't do the German accent. And I said, the University of Toronto. And he said, I'm Eric, you're Adrian. And I said, yes. And he said, this is what you will be paid, $42.50 each time you appear. After five times, you have to join the union because the CBC is a closed shop. If we don't like you, we will throw you back out into the gutter. He said, I'm not going to say where you belong because I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I said, fine, I'll take it. And so I did it and they liked it. And then about four months later, somebody said to me at the show, um, would you like to try and do an interview and talk to somebody? you know, about things. I said, sure, I love to talk to people about things. So I sat down and talked to some man from the Royal Ontario Museum, the poor man, uh, about um, textiles, of which I knew nothing. But they had I, had, I did a little reading. They said, it's about textiles. So, you know, talk to him about textiles. So I did. And, um, and after that, they, you know, nobody said anything except they said, fine, we'll see. Call you. Then Anna Cameron, who was the host of the program, told me in the makeup room, she said, I'm not going to stay on this show. I've done it for several years now, and I want to go back to the stage while I'm still relatively young. She was 36, I <laughs> think of it now. And she said, I want to go back to the, to the stage. And she said, they're going to be auditioning people for my to be host here. And I think you should you should audition. And I said, really? And she said, yes. And, you know, in September, I will leave. And so they said to me, would you like to audition? And I said, sure, I'll audition. And... Um, I did. And that was one of the last great cattle calls at the CBC. I don't think they do them that way anymore. There were about 40 women all sort of waiting to go on and, and interview people. And they were taped. And about two weeks later, they called me and said, you have the job. And that was exactly the way it happened. Now, I never had any illusions uh, because Eric was wonderful. He was my boss. And I really thought he was hysterical. And we had we shared a sense of humor, very sardonic, very dark. And he said, you know, if you're no good, you won't last. But if you are good, you could last for a long time. And I've always remembered that because uh, a lot of people didn't last for a long time. And I'm extremely proud of it because I did last, you know, for over 30, maybe nearly 40 years in different programs, always for the CBC. 
with all its problems and its weirdness, the CBC has been my home because public broadcasting is my home. And I believe in that educate, entertain, um, and enlighten that was the CBC's mandate and always has been. So that was how I got into it. And then after that, I did that show for 10 years. I did four shows a week out of five. We each, Paul Souls and I each did one show alone a week and then we did four together. And I interviewed everybody in the world, et cetera, uh, things, everything. We had a wonderful, wonderful time. It's my favorite show of everything I ever did. We brought it. We brought television into color for the first time on on Take Thirty. We were the I was the experiment for color um, because it was 1968 nine something like that. It was after Expo because all our stuff for Expo '67 was done in black and white and on film. I came in and there was Johnny Grizzell. I heard had heard about him. He was the one who lit the studios. Then when they did Swan Lake. And when they did the Shakespearean thing, you know, Sean Connery came and did Macbeth live in, C in CBC Studio 7. Um, he was a young Scottish actor and everybody said, oh, he's really great. And then about a year later, he became James Bond. Um, but Johnny Grizzell was this great lighting director. And he's, he is the person who made me believe that when you do anything, lighting is everything if it's, if it's theatrical. And he did experiments with, with me, with these big bottom scoop lights on the floor, with things up above, et cetera. And he said, never let anybody light you as though you were an object. You're not an object, you're a human being. And I took that also as a model for, for life in a way, um, that nothing, that what was done for a human being was different than anything else, even if it was an inanimate object doing it to you. So that was that was it. I, I didn't train for it. I never particularly thought of it as 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 something that I would do. And um, and I really knew that I just loved it. I loved it. I could do it. And um, and from then on, from 65, really, until I, I left my I left Adrian Clarkson Presents in six, in 99. It really was my mother house. I mean, I had six, uh, five years out as agent general for Ontario. But apart from that, um, uh, it really was, it was my mother house, my, my, my home. So we actually have many of the scripts uh, from episodes uh, on Take 30 and, and some of your other shows. And um, you really discussed an incredibly broad range of topics um, you know, books, motherhood, cooking, many issues of the day, um, some of which were quite sensitive, like abortion and illegal drug use. Um, you also discussed issues that were, were very close to your heart, and like things around the first French immersion schools and experiences of, of, of immigrants, uh, an experience you had uh, in Canada. So do you feel that the research you did on those issues helped inform your later work and, and uh, some of your later interests? Well, I think the wonderful thing about Take 30 was that we were able to do almost anything as long as it was interesting. We had a group of women particularly who were our researchers and had been, they were called story editors, not producers, because women were not allowed to be called producers. There was the first woman producer at the CBC who was given the title of producer. Um, was Cynthia Scott, who worked with me. And she and I were the same age. We were still very good friends. She left the show about uh, six years on and went to the film board. She subsequently had a wonderful life in film there, and she won an Academy Award for Best Short Documentary for Flamenco at 515. We're still very good friends. Uh, and so really women did all the work and had lots of ideas and were... Uh, very responsible for for nurturing and bringing on very interesting things. But then then got a few male producers, and of course the executive producer was always a male. And um, uh, I, I really think that the things, the subjects we did, we were saying once I wanted to find out why women didn't have children. Some women didn't have children, so we did a series of uh, women who didn't have children and why they had didn't have children. We were the first to talk about whether you could find your your real parents if you were adopted 
um, we took up the question of sex education in schools. We had wonderful people freelancing for us who'd bring us ideas too. There was a wonderful woman called Margaret Norquay who did a lot of our, our kind of what I'd call social, uh, social uh, studies programming. Um, the idea about finding your parents was really something that was very, you know, not thought about a lot in 1969, 70, and many people were worried about it. Um, we talked about men and marriage. We talked, we followed the first Royal Commission on, um, the Royal Commission on the status of women uh, all across Canada. Uh, Ed Reed, my co-host, who's unfortunately not with us anymore, wonderful guy, he went and he would bring back the report once a week or twice a week, depending on where they were in the country. And um, that was chaired by Anne Francis, whose real name was Florence, Florence Bird. And um, so it really, and that was the day, you know, CBC, that reminds me that CBC, when it had women commentators on radio, there were all these women named, you know, Marjorie McClintock and, and Mary McMillan and, um, and Jane something or other and, and and none of them were their real names. It was the CBC who thought they should have nice middle of the road type, you know, whitish names and <laughs> all these people. And so Anne Francis was really, her real name was Florence Bird. What was wrong with Florence Bird? I have no idea, but they called her Anne Francis and she, because she had a broadcasting career before. Um, so we were able to do all of these things and we, were, we, we talked with people about things. I, I loved it because we would often spend a whole half hour just talking to somebody. Uh, when we were doing our, our Men in Marriage series, which I later turned into a book, we I'd talk with a man for one one whole half hour. We, all of this, you know, was really quite wonderful. And um, and we could do anything, and the audience loved us. I, I felt they wrote letters. I would, I would get these wonderful typewritten letters from farm wives in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And I had a little link with that because when I was at university, I did... I went into a competition for summer jobs because I didn't want to work at Freeman's department store anymore. And um, now the Bay. And uh, I, I got into a summer program at Tunney's Pasture with the Dominion Bureau of Statistics, as it was then called, now StatsCan. And I became their expert on Western uh, agriculture. And uh, Manitoba, <laughs> Saskatchewan, were, and Alberta were my things. And actually, they said to me, you know, if you ever want a job here, you don't have to go back to university. This was at my first summer. Uh, you don't have to go back to university. We'll give you a job. We'll put you on a, you know, really, you'll be a clerk, whatever it is, number, et cetera. And I said, no, no, I'm going to finish university. And I really didn't like the job. And it was, it was, the thing was, it was close to where we were living. We lived out on the mountain road by then in a nice property with a big garden and everything and I could come across the Champlain Bridge very fast <laughs> in the mornings to work and and of course it, in the summer about half of the time or a third of the time we were left to go home early because the the nurse would come in and if the temperature was above 90 we were all dismissed and we were able to go home because they didn't have air conditioning and or if somebody fainted and we could always count on Raymond to faint and um and so I basically, you know, basically, you know, because I was good at math and everything, I was really good at doing these surveys um, of of the farms and um, and to be, you know, that that was just one of those things. I never had any practice doing any other things in the summers. No, no glamorous jobs or travel when I was young. Well, that's kind of fun, actually. My my very first job, professional job as a librarian, was at Statistics Canada. So, <laughs> We share an experience in common there. Um, I want to move on to something a little more frivolous. Um, we have some fabulous photos of you um, in your CBC dressing room. Your <laughs> and I have to say, I would die to have that gorgeous bright blue and black plaid jacket. Yeah. Um, and oh, I didn't uh, have that. How, what size are you? I'll give it to you. <laughs> You yeah. still have today, and thinking that black that's it's dark, dark brown and um and blue actually. And, ah. um, yeah, so you know, it, it it really if what size are you? Sort of, oh, no, yeah. no, we, we can talk about that. You know, <laughs> off side. It's an Issy um, Miyake, it's an Issy Miyake, and that's oh. my designer of choice. 
um, wow. because anything between sort of Mark's work warehouse and Isimiyaki, I don't, I don't get actually. <laughs> okay, those are, those are your two go-to. That's my two goals, yeah. So, so in these photos, were you, um, was it to do with continuity around shows or were you trying on outfits that you might be probably, wearing? On, yeah, on, probably on just camera? looking at them because things that look good on you in life don't always look good on camera. <laughs> that was something that I learned. And so often my on-camera things were not the kind of things that I would I wanted to wear because they were they don't sit well or and always chair you know the horrible thing is even now and I started in television what 65 years ago or something yeah 65 years ago I started in television and those stools were horrible they were not made for women and they still put, make women sit on stools it is absolutely ridiculous they have not done anything to make sure that things suit women the the lavalier mics were made for to be put on men's ties and lapels. They were not made to go on women's clothes. Nothing has been made for a necklace that would be would be a, a microphone. Nothing has been done for women. If women don't stand up, scream and shout and start to say, I'm gonna cut your head off, uh, nothing is done for them. There's, it's just, you know, just look at the way that TV studios are still set up. It's appalling, appalling. And and I, you mentioned earlier about your fan mail, and and you got a, received letters all the time um, from people that were were where well, they felt that they were your your friends, and and uh, especially from um, you know mothers that were home with children. Yeah. And you yeah. had a series of episodes where you actually talked about pregnancy and motherhood, and you were an expectant mother at the time. That's right. Yeah, I worked, I worked right up to the day I gave birth, both with both um, with both pregnancies, and we did a show called the Great Pregnancy Race or something. And once once a week, we would talk about the stage that I was at at pregnancy, and people identified with that. You know, that show was so to me intimate connection with with Canadian women. It was wonderful, and nothing makes me happier in the world than standing on a street corner and somebody comes up to me and says. You know, I'm going to tell my mother I saw you because you used to save her life um, on Take 30. And I'll tell you a wonderful story. Um, I had heard vaguely that when Adrienne Arsenault appeared on The National, that she, her mother had named her for me. And I thought, oh, she just found the name through me. So then I said to Adrienne, whom I only talked to for the first time really personally uh, a few months ago, as we were talking about COVID and something, and I called her and talked to her. And I said, I hear, I've heard that you were named for me. Is that true? And Adrian said, yes, it's absolutely true. And I've always wanted to call you and say, let's meet and talk. Because my mother, when she was pregnant with me, I was so, I used to move around so much and hit her from inside. And, and she, you know, she really felt uncomfortable in the last couple of months because she kept thinking, what's happening here? Because I would be kicking her and so on. And the only time she was calm and I was calm was when she turned on take 30 in the afternoon and I and Adrian Clarkson came on. And so she said to her husband, Adrian, Adrian Arsenault's mother, I don't care whether this child, whether this child is a girl or a boy, it's going to be called Adrian. <laughs> and so I was really thrilled about that. And so that may, you know, there may be other stories out like that. And certainly, um, People would write letters saying, you know, you've saved my life. I remember farm women uh, saying, you know, I'm, I'd always take this time to come in because you saved my life. I would learn things. I would do things. I, I always wanted to, to know more things. And you've brought this into me. And I would never have known this. And that made me feel so wonderful because that was what it was about. That was what I really wanted people to think, that, that I was having the privilege of learning these things that I could pass them on to other people and bring them into the circle. You know, why should some people not, not be part of it? That's what television and why I've always loved television is because it can be inclusive, because it can help people to be part of, of everything, of, of, of the world being brought to them. If, if it's not their fault that, that they, they can't get the car and, and drive, you know, to Brandon from their farm, it's not their fault because, you know, they've got five children under the age of seven. Uh, it's it's very very interesting, and so I I 
felt that connection with the audience in a way which was really a wonderful human one. And it's, it's the one that I treasure the most and will always remember the most. Now, the time has just sped by, can I say? <laughs> um, and um, this has been incredible, an incredible conversation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited to have the chance um, to, to meet you and talk to you. Uh, um, I could talk all day to you. That's just, we, I love, I love thinking about things like Take 30 and so on. It was wonderful, wonderful time. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think we may, we may need to invite you back another time so we can explore <laughs> other parts of your career and, and life. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for taking the time um, to have this conversation, to share some of your experiences, and especially to thank you for trusting Libraries and Archives Canada for hosting your fabulous archives, which is going to have a massive impact, I think, on Canadians in the future for them to be able to experience and understand your life and as well the life of Canadians uh, during during the time that you were a journalist and a writer, and of course, our, our Governor General. So I'd just like to um, thank you. And um, I look forward to the next chapter on Adrian Clarkson. <laughs> yes, there's bound to be another chapter. There is. Thank you. I have really enjoyed talking to you and uh, looking at some of those things, which I, you know, as I say, to me, the past is always the past. And I'm glad that my parents save things and that you know, Take 30 Save Things, and the archives has things from Take 30 anyway, too, at the programs. Um, and so to think of it as lasting is, um, is quite, a, quite humbling, actually. Thank you so much. Thank you.